Welcome back to Vex Isn't Scary. This is part four, and in this part, we're going over channel functions. Now, in the previous part, we went over functions, and we discussed that they're pieces of code that we can feed arguments to, and they'll do some processing and give us something back. Now, there's a special type of function, and it is a channel function. What these do is they create spare parameters on your attribute wrangle. What does this mean? Well, it means that we can create things like text fields or sliders or channel ramps. Basically the things that you would see on a node where you would put in your inputs, except now we can put it onto our attribute wrangle. So we can make a custom node which uses our code and then we can feed it inputs. So this is one of those things that are a lot easier to understand when you see it, but let's get straight into it. In Houdini, we can begin by dropping down a geometry node. We can just call this one part four channel functions. In here, we're going to go ahead and drop down a sphere and then a scatter node. And you may notice that my points are massive over here. And you know, that's not a, a bug or anything. I've changed it to be like this for vexes and scary. If you want it to look the same in your viewport, you can press D, go over to geometry and increase the point size to 10. I think by default, it's about three. Or so, um, yeah, I think it's about three. So you can push it up to 10 if you want. Just a little tip if you're working with points and you need to see where they are a bit more clearly. All right, so let's drop an attribute wrangle. And we're going to begin with a new function. This isn't a channel function, this is just a new function. So Alt E to bring this up. So the idea here is to move our points from where they are to the origin based on a blend value. So if they're at the origin, then it's fully blended to origin. If they're halfway, then it's halfway blended, that sort of thing. So to do that, we can use lerp. Lerp stands for linear interpolate. And that just means straight interpolation, straight blending. So blend between this value and this value. To start with, we know that we want to be affecting our position, right? We want to move our points between origin and where they are. So we say v at p, remember, lowercase v, capital P, equals. L E R P LERP. That stands for linear interpolate. And then in here, it takes three arguments. The first argument is just value one. So that would be V at P, which is the current position. And then the second value would be zero because we want it to be the origin. And then the third value is a blend value. So I'm going to set it to zero for now. Apply and accept, and nothing will have changed. But if you change the blend argument to 0.2, it moves closer to the origin. If you change it to 0 0.5, as you can see, it moves closer and closer until you reach one, right? So it's a value between zero and one. Zero will be this value. One will be this value. And then it feeds that into our position value. So that's pretty cool. But you know, a couple of things, it would be better to have this as a variable. So let's press Alt E to bring this back up. And above here, we'll just make a float called blend and we'll make it equal to 0 0.5, semicolon. And then over here for our third argument, we can use that blend variable. So now this will be equal to whatever our blend variable is equal to, right? Very simple. Now, wouldn't it be cool if we could rather use a slider? So we could slide between the values and control our blend. That is where channel functions come in. Over here, you start with ch. That's the start of it right? That just stands for channel. And then you're going to put the data type. So in our case, it needs to be a float. So you say chf or float. So obviously for an integer, it would be chi. For a vector, it would be chv. For a string, it would be chs. So in here, the only thing that we need to give it is a name. And that name goes in inverted commas because it's a string. And so we can call this blend underscore value. Now, notice that I used an underscore and not a space, because this doesn't actually recognize spaces. You have to use an underscore so that it knows that this should be separate. You apply and accept, and then once you have that, you won't notice anything different on your attribute wrangle. You have to go over here to the right and click on create spare parameters for each unique call of ch. If you click on that and then scroll down, you'll see our blend value over there, right? There's the name over there, blend value, and it turns it into a parameter blend value. So that's really cool because now if we slide this along. Okay, so what happens if we wanted to do this with colors? 
Now I'm going to show you the not so smart way to do it. And then I'm going to show you the better way to do it. So Alt plus E to bring this up. Now, if we want to do this with colors, you may think to create a color. We could do vector color one equals, and then we could do what we've done before with set. And we could do zero comma, zero comma one. That one's blue. And then vector color two equals set. One comma zero comma zero, semicolon at the end. And then you'd want a blend variable to blend between them. So you'd say something like float color blend equals 0.5. And then obviously you would do your v at cd equals linear interpolate. And you would interpolate between your two colors. Color one, comma, color two, comma, color blend. Okay, so pretty simple. We just made three variables and then fed it in as arguments for lerp. Apply and accept. And there you have it, right? So if you have to change your color blend value to say 0 0.2, 0 0.1, right? Very expected. So let's make this a bit smarter by swapping these out for channel vectors. So you say chv, and then you can say color underscore one. And over here, you would say chv, color underscore two. And then your color blend would be a float, so chf. And in here, we would just call it something like color blend, right? And we apply and accept with that. And you'll notice that it becomes black because all of these values don't exist. So it's just giving it zeros at the moment. So you have to create your spare parameters. As you can see, we have a color blend value and our two colors. Now, logically, you know, it's a vector. Color one and color two would have three components. That's cool. Right, so you could have 100 zero, zero, or 001, zero, zero, and then you could give it a color blend of like 0 0.5, and now you can play around with the slider. But this over here isn't the best way for us to choose a color. What happens if we wanted something like maroon? How would we get maroon with these values, right? It's a bit difficult. It would be like 0 0.3 and like 0 0.05 or something, and that would sort of give you maroon. But that's not very intuitive. So, what you have to do is you have to change this from three separate floats to a color vector. And so we go up here to this cog, we click on it, and we say edit parameter interface. Now, this may look a bit intimidating, but if you just stop to look at it for a second, you might notice something. So on our angle, by default, we have code and we have bindings, right? We have these two tabs to it. If you look over here, we also have code and bindings. And everything below that are our variables, right? Our blend value, our color blend, our color one, and our color two. So we can select color one, and on the right hand side where it says type, you can change this from a float vector three to a color. And then go to color two and do the same. So from float vector three to color. Apply and accept. And look at that. We still have those three float values, but we also have a color picker with it. So now we can very easily pick whatever colors we want and we can blend between those two. And then we have the other one for our position, and that's all very cool. But there is an even better way of doing this. So Alt plus E to bring this back up. And now I'm going to show you the best way to do this. So we can remove color one and color two. We can also remove V at CD, right? If we apply, all of those values are gone. And if you go back to this cog, you can say delete all spare parameters and then recreate them, right? So those extra ones that we had for color are now gone. We now just have blend value and color blend. Now in our string editor, what we're going to do is we're going to say v at cd equals ch, right? Expected. But now we're going to use ch ramp and then give it the two brackets. And this actually takes two arguments. Firstly, it takes a name. So we've done that before. We can just call this something like color underscore ramp, comma. Then we have to give it a driver, something that controls where along the ramp we are. And we can use our color blend for that. So now we apply and accept, create our spare parameters. We end up with this color ramp over here. And it goes from zero. If you click on this little handle over here, it'll tell you position zero, value zero. So that is at position zero, have value of zero. If you click on the other handle, it's at position one with a value of one. And so something in between, 
right? You can see that it's about position 0.5 and you can adjust the value. So if we color blend, it should go from zero to one or from black to white. And that's exactly what it does. And so this color ramp, we can actually go and change it to be a color ramp instead of this float ramp. So go back up to your edit parameter interface, down to color ramp, and you'll see over here it says ramp type float. We can click on that and change it to color, apply and accept. Now we have these two handles and if we double click on a handle, we can give it a color. So we can go red and blue and blend between them. So when color blend is zero, we're at position zero on the ramp. When color blend is one, we're at position one on the ramp. And that means that we can also input other colors in between these two. So perhaps we want to make the center point white. Now it should go from red to white to blue, right? At about 0 0.5, it's white. At zero, it's red. So now I'm going to show you something that might throw you a bit. This is something that people often get confused with, with the ramps. And that is the fact that they reset after every whole number. What does that mean? It means that they basically only take into consideration the decimal value. So that means that one is the same as two, which is the same as three, because it is a whole number. And so that also means that 0 0.5 is the same as 1.5, which is the same as 2.5, because it's only actually using this 0.5 value. What that means for us is that if we have a value of 1, and then it goes beyond 1, it resets, it goes back to the start. Now, that might be what you want, but a lot of cases it's not. And so, you know, the usual fix is to just make the beginning and end points the same color, so you would have blue on the one end, blue on the other end, and then it doesn't matter. You can just go back and forth between blue, white, blue, white, blue, white, blue, white. The other thing would be to use what we used in the previous tutorial, which is a fit node, so that it never goes beyond one. It'll always be between zero and one. And so, you know, you can mess around with that. I just need you to know that when it goes past one, it resets. Okay, great. So let's delete that. And let's start afresh making something new. Let's create an attribute wrangle. And let's put to use what we just learned. So Alt E to bring this up. And we'll just start with a blend, float blend. And this time, we'll make it equal to at time. Now, at time is an attribute that Houdini recognizes, much like at frame. But at time is your current frame divided by your frame rate. So if we're going at 24 frames per second, then time would be one at 24. So time is basically just how many seconds along our timeline we are. At frame is the actual frame that we're on. We'll use at time for this over here. And then we're going to do something a little bit tricky. I want you to follow along carefully because this might be a bit confusing. So you say float position blend. And we're going to make this equal to a channel ramp. And this ramp is going to be called position. And the driver that it's going to use is going to be our blend variable. So now we have a blend, which is based on time, and a position blend, which is based on blend, but based on where along the ramp you are. Now that may seem a bit confusing, but we'll get back to that. Now we can say VFP equals linear interpolate. And we're going to linear interpolate between P and the origin based on our position blend. Semicolon at the end. Let's apply and accept and see what that does. So create your spare parameters and see you have position and you have your blend based on time. So that means as this plays back, it's moving along this ramp, right? Based on time. So time is the driver for this ramp. And every time time goes past one, it'll reset. So as you can see, it hits 25, resets, 48, 49, resets, right? And that's based on this value over here. So you could very easily move this to about 0.5 and add a point at the end. 
end. And then if you switch on your real-time toggle and play this back, you'll see that it bounces instead of resetting. Because now it's going to that point and then coming back down and then resetting. So it's resetting to the same value each time. Okay, so that's kind of cool. Let's do something with color. So we can say if he at CD equals channel ramp, color underscore ramp, and we can also drive it by blend. And now you'll see it's a float ramp. So let's go to our parameter interface, edit parameter interface, color ramp, change it from a float to a color, apply and accept. Color ramp, give it two colors, maybe two nice blue colors. In this one, I'm actually not going to worry about reset. I think it'll be kind of cool if it flashes. Okay, how could we make this different per point? What happens if we had to use the point's position? So to our time, we had to add at p dot y, right? The y value of our p attribute. And then you play that back, and it looks completely different. Because now what it's doing is this value is no longer the same for every point. Points at the origin will have a value of zero, so they'll be at the start. Points up here will have a value of one, so they'll be at the other end. Points halfway between will be at 0.5. And then we add time to it, so that over time, all of those values are shifted. What this means for us is that we can now change this ramp over here something a bit more interesting. Now, what happens if we had to increase our scatter points and then move us closer to this start value over here so that our points are more together? And we could also include the x value. So we could say plus at p dot x and it angles it like that. Now you may be thinking, well, okay, but what would you do with something like this? This is actually great for an abstract effect. If you had to increase this even higher to say 50,000, and then you had to use a VDB from particle fluid and change this to about 0 0.5, maybe lower, then do a VDB smooth, and then a VDB convert and convert it to a geometry. So if you had to do a file cache node and save it somewhere, just as part or test, $f.bgeo.se, and we'll only need to save 24 frames because this is an effect that repeats. Then if you had to adjust your end frame and load from disk, you could then turn this into a fluid. You could give this a basic fluid shader and you'll end up with something like this. Alternatively, you could even do something like a connectivity, so connect adjacent points, and you would connect adjacent, reducing the search points to maybe 15, and then also reducing the scatter, maybe 5,000. Increase the number of points that are in between, give this a more threatening color, and then run a blur. And then if you had to turn this into a polywire and render this out, you would end up with something like this. So I do hope that this opened your mind up to what channel functions are useful for. We only use channel ramp, channel vector, and channel float. In the future, we will be using channel integer and channel string. And in some of our other tutorials, we've already used that. So if you do come across it, at least you now know what it is and what it does. So I hope you enjoyed this part. We'll be back with part five soon. We're going over the rest of our conditionals, that is the for loop, the for each loop, and the while loop. And then we can get into far more fun projects, because we'll have a good understanding of all of the basics. So, I'll see you next time. Thanks for joining me again. Bye.